fathers and our mothers to what has been an incredible and exciting season of equipping, empowering in the presence of the Lord. As the Lord, through his mighty servant, anointed servant, our Father and the Lord, Pastor Dr. W.F. Kumi, has led us to the depths of revelation. And we're drinking in from the depths of the living waters that he has been sending forth to us from the throne of grace. And I believe and I know that as you listen and as you studiously participate in this conference from all over the world, the Lord himself will establish you. He will strengthen you. He will do good in your life in the name of Jesus Christ. We're also mightily indebted to the wonderful body of Christ uh, in Tarava and the adjoining regions. And we're learning so much from this great body of Christ, from their unity, the, the charity, the togetherness, and the incredible potential of the body of Christ when it gathers together and harnesses all of its gifts and graces. And our prayer is that we'll be able to replicate the same bonds of love and cooperation that we see that marks uh, your assembly. The church is marching forward. And the gates of hell with all its assaults and assail can never prevail against the church of God. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we are grateful to you for this day. We thank you for the privilege we have to gather with the saints before the Lord to be taught, be instructed by the Spirit of God so that we can be equipped to take our world for Christ. And thank you because, Lord, you want everyone to be involved in this move. You want the children involved. You want the young adults involved. You want those on campuses involved. You want, Lord Father, every segment of the church, the young, the old, women and men, to be involved in reaching the world for Christ. We are the light of the world. And uh, people that are lightened cannot stay in darkness. But we must go forth and spread forth the light. And so, Lord, we are asking you this day that you will breathe upon us, that you will touch every segment and aspect of the church, and you will strategically position us to do mighty things for your name so that your kingdom will come and your will be done. Father, we ask in this session that you'll be with us, and you'll guide us, Lord, as we examine your word. Let your word profit our lives and let your name be glorified in Jesus' precious name. And all the saints of God said, Amen. This evening, we're looking at a strategic kind of message. Uh, it's titled, Strategic Engagement of the Militant Church for Christ's Mission. Strategic Engagement of the militant church for Christ's mission. That's quite a mouthful, and we're going to be unpacking segments of the message as it relates to this topic. But first of all, let's go to the book of Acts chapter 13, and we'll quickly run through the first 12 verses, and that will set the stage for what we're going to be examining uh, this evening. In Acts chapter 13, if you have your Bibles, if you kindly open along with me, Acts 13, we're reading from the first verse. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. We're going to find out that this is Paul. And they ministered to the Lord and fasted. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also John to their minister. And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. 
But Elemas, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, which stood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, will thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. In verse 12, then the deputy, praise God, then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Here is church militant. Here is church triumphant. Here is church strategic. And the God we serve is a strategic God. And when Jesus, when he was speaking to the disciples, he said, you're going to start from Jerusalem and then you will head out into Judea and then into Samaria and then you'll keep trickling along and this cloud of glory will keep spreading unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And here we find God doing a great work as these men and women, strategic, militant, engaged the Gentile world. They did not disengage. They engaged. They went to the chief places. They stood in the chief place of concourse to communicate Christ. And we're going to see how that happened. But this week, just this week, a United Nations report announced that the eighth billionth person had been born on the earth. Eight billionth person just this week. So officially, our incredible planet, which is the theater of God's most active work, is now racing towards the nine billion mark. Nine billion. Take a moment to think about this. Eight billion people. Think about how many people we've been able to reach in our various denominations and we're so very grateful for everyone who has gathered. But think about the people we've been able to reach and then compare that to 8 billion people. That's a staggering number. It reminds us then that there are still vast multitudes to be reached for Christ and they will be reached. I said, they will be reached in Jesus' name. And if you know anything about population arithmetic, population arithmetic is geometric arithmetic. It is not additive, it's multiplicative. So if you, if you find a place where you have two people, you come, the next day, it's four. The next time, it's not four, it's eight. Not eight, 16, 32, 64, 256. 512, 1024. It keeps doubling and galloping. So, we've been told that person number 8 billion has been born. So, before long, we'll reach 9 billion. And we'll keep marching. And so, the church, what God is doing for us is saying, I want to charge you. I want to recharge you. I want to strategically position you. I want every member of the church, man, woman, and child, to be involved in reaching the unlost people. The question is, looking at these 8 billion people, we are told that 63% of these 8 billion people are under the age of 39 years old. And it varies from continent to continent, but just on the average, we have about 63% under the age of 40. And I'm sure in our churches, we have young people the question then is, how can we unlock every aspect of the body of Christ for evangelism? Because the Son of Man is come to seek and to save the lost. And Jesus, our Savior, was a young man. And he came with a mandate. He came with a mission. He came, his eyes firmly fixed on the goal. He says, 
He saw them fainting as sheep without a shepherd. He was moved. He was persuaded, persuaded to the point that he went through Gethsemane, through to Golgotha, onto Calvary, and he gave himself for us. So how then can we harness this mighty body of Christ for the work of evangelism? How can we get everyone involved? First John chapter 2 verse 12 tells us that there are so many aspects, so many branches within the church. And God wants to lay hands on every aspect of the church so that this work can be done swiftly. It will be done swiftly. So the work can be done rapidly. It will be done for the glory of God. Look at First John 2 and I read from verse 12. I write unto you little children because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you fathers because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you young men because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you little children because ye have known the father. I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. So John keeps harping on these aspects of the church. There are the young. There are the young adults. There are the youths. There are the men. There are the women. There are the elders, the fathers, the aged. That point the way to us. I say, march along with me as we go into the regions beyond. And that's how the Lord wants us to think strategically. He wants us to think about reaching the lost through all these methods. These engage every aspect of the church so that by the grace of God, not only 8 billion, but all of the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. As we look at this text very quickly, three points. Number one, we look at the assembled men. Look at the men that were assembled in Antioch. Number two, we look at the audacious mandates. What a mandate God gave them audacious he said you will go to the ends of the earth you'll be a light to the gentiles by the grace of god audacious mandate and finally the anointed missionaries very quickly let's look at the assembled men the men that were assembled now before you can get any work done they tell us the the uh the elements of production you need land you need materials you need resources. You gather those things together before you think about engaging or embarking on a task. So under this assembled men, three things. The calling of sound disciples. There must be an effort. There must be a plan. We must engage every aspect of the church with an intent in mind. With a goal in mind. We're calling them or making them sound. We're calling them but we're making them special. We're calling them, but we're establishing them in the most holy faith. The calling of sound disciples. Number two, the communion of seeking disciples. Not only did they gather together, but also they communed. They spent time with God. And this is one thing that we, our, our fathers have so mastered that we must ensure that our young ones master. Lord, teach us how to pray. Pastor, Teach me how to pray. Brother, I see how you engage God with those who hasten to the place where God, the Savior, shows his face. Gladly take our station there and wait for the sweet hour of prayer. Mom, how are you able to wait? We must teach them. There must be a deliberate effort, the communion of seeking disciples. Number three, the consecration of sold out disciples. The consecration of sold out disciples. So number one, here we find they were, they, were, they were in the church in Antioch, Acts 13 verse 1. Now there was at a church in Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas, Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Look at the names that were mentioned. The question is, how were these men assembled? The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 11, Acts 11, we see how Saul himself came to join this group. Acts 11 from verse 25. The Bible says uh, in Acts 11 from verse 
25, it tells us how Paul joined this motley group. It says, and behold, uh, Acts 11 from verse 25, then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. Don't wait for them to come. The young ones, seek them out in the church. Don't wait for them to say, oh, uh, brother, can you please mentor me? Seek them out. The Bible says of, of Barnabas from verse, 20, from verse 23, who when he came, speaking about his own character, and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and exhorted them all that they with purpose of heart will cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man. It takes a good man to raise good men. It says it was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith and much people, listen now, was added unto the Lord. Verse 25, then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. I want to challenge you to look out at the young people in your crowd, in your congregation. They may look like they're not interested, but they are. See, young people love excitement. A lot of people love the, they love some noise. They, they, they want to have some ruckus. They, where's, where's noise the loudest? That's where they want to be. You, you know, you think about how the world attracts them. There, there's a, there's a bazaar. There is, there is this thing going on there. And they're all excited about that. We have to create the same excitement under God and thank God we have the Holy Ghost, the most exciting person there is. I tell our young people, I was on my way in uh, this morning and I had a young man who picked me up um, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a, uh, a lift ride coming in. And I said, and get young man, young man. I said, I said, this man, you're a candidate for glory. You're a candidate for God. You're a candidate to be set, used by God. And as he was driving, we began slowly to, to, to touch and touch. And eventually we came to the gospel. And he said, he said to me, he said, you know, he said, uh, I, I used to be in church. I, I haven't attended church for five years now. He said, I used to be a member of, he mentioned the church and all of that. And I waited for him. And I told him, I said, do you know what? He said, but since then, I haven't been interested. I said, the church is God's crown jewel. The church is God's theater. I said, did you know that while people go to the theater to watch film shows, the angels come to watch the church. Hey, what's going on in this church? What's going on? And the, the angels get their education from the church. And I said, you know what? You're missing a lot. He, he perked up. He said, oh, really? I'm like, yeah. And then we went on and on and on and on and on. By the time we're done, he gave his life to Christ. He said, I am coming to your church. I said, come. I said, you better come. God wants us to seek them out. Then went Barnabas for to Tassos to seek Saul. It was a young man he had heard about. And he, the man had fled uh, because after his conversion, you know what happened? The Jews set upon him to destroy him. But thank God, he escaped and he went somewhere unknown and nobody was asking after him. Thank God for Barnabas. He went and he fetched him. And then Paul the Apostle himself too, if you look at Acts, um, Acts chapter 16 from verse 1 to 3, he did the same thing for Timothy. Find a Timothy, my brother. Find a Timothy. As leaders, let's find them. Let's not be tired of them. Let's not be disgusted with them. Let's not give up on them. Let's not say, well, he failed before. I don't think he can succeed. He will succeed. Eventually, he will succeed under grace, under God, by his spirit, by your help, through your prayers. God will strengthen them that look to be. We need them. We need them. They know things that we can never dream to know. They have experiences that we have long forgotten. We need them in the forefront of the gospel. And they will arise a mighty army for the glory of God. Acts chapter 18 from verse, uh, from verse uh, first 16, I'm sorry. Acts 16, we're reading from verse 1. Then came he to Derby and Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, 
the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess and believed, but his father was Greek. That could have disqualified him. His father was Greek. That could have left. Well, his, his, his mother comes to deeper life, or his mother comes to uh, glory tabernacle, or his mother comes, but his father does not come. It doesn't matter. So long as he comes, that's all we need. So long as we can see him, hey, Timothy, come on up here. No prejudice, no questions asked, no uh, second guessing. And say encouragement, say, Timothy, I see the glory of God in you. <laughs> I see God wanting to work through you. And Paul took him. Well reported by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have given to me. That's the man of Tassos. Give me that young man. In the hands, the Bible speaks about David Tamil, Tamil uh, uh, isn't there for us, but David took a motley crowd. Those who were discouraged, those who were in debt, those who were disenfranchised. He took that motley crowd and as he worked on them, he turned them into mighty warriors. By the grace of God, we have the scriptures, we have the spirit, we have the word of God that we can share with them. Bring them to know Christ, and then they will become useful instruments. Well, yeah, it goes without saying that Timothy became a mighty instrument in the hands of God. Timothy became a mighty instrument. Look at Psalm 126. Psalm 126. And see what the Bible says about the potential of young people when correctly, adequately harnessed what they can do for the glory of God. Psalm uh, some some one some 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 120 uh, 27 i'm sorry 127 from verse 4 look children and heritage of the lord and the fruit of the womb is reward as arrows are in the hands of a mighty man so are the children of thy youth these men were called and then number two they communed they communed with the lord they sought the lord we need to teach our young our youths how to pray we need to organize meetings we need to organize allow them to organize their own vigils allow them to have personal time where they can learn how to seek the lord be with them in those. let them watch you praying let them watch you groaning you may say well i don't want them to copy me. let them copy you okay at some point they'll begin to develop their own skills and abilities but be there let them watch you groaning in prayer seeking the lord knowing him jeremiah 9 verse 13 you will seek me and find me when you've sought for me with all your heart and, and the disciples came to jesus said lord teach us how to pray as john taught his disciples so we find in acts 13 this group of young men gathered together seeking the lord and the lord spoke unto them acts 13 and from verse 2 and as they ministered to the lord and fasted as they ministered to the lord and fasted the bible says the holy ghost said separate me barnabas and so for the work whereunto I have called him. Let's teach our young people that they need to seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. To seek him. To seek him. That God will not do everything by himself. Salvation is part divine and part design. He pardons and we believe. Sanctification. He provides and we surrender. Spirit baptism. He promises and then I tarry. Let's teach them that the best of God is obtained by seeking the Lord. And as we do that, the Lord would help us in Jesus' name. As we seek to harness the, the gifts of the entire church for the work of evangelism, as we strategically position people for that task, what are some examples we can learn? Number one, we can learn from Nebuchadnezzar's men. Look at how Nebuchadnezzar built his nation. Think about that. And let's learn from the Gentile king some lessons. He'll come into a city. He'll search for the young people. He'll, he'll gather them together and then he'll take them to his land. Then he will proselytize them. Then he will convert them. Then he will acculturate them. And then he will then use them as tools in his 
kingdom. And that kingdom lasted. Remember, it was the head of gold. So, number one, catch them young. Number two, keep them strong. Number three, engage them for long. Catch them young. Catch them from the children's church. Let them get involved in activities. Sometimes we say, well, we know, I got to wait until he dots all the I's and he crosses all the T's. I got to wait until he, 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 uh, he stops playing soccer and takes the things of God seriously. Listen, kids will be kids. The youth will be youth. A youth cannot become an adult overnight. And so in the self-same way, they, they, they call it the, the model of growth. Same thing too. We should not, we should not get them to go past that, uh, that process that God has designed. We'll make sure that we catch them young. Then we keep them strong, keep them engaged in the work of the ministry. I remember many years ago, uh, with, I, I thank God for the Deeper Life Bible Church. This is the church where I grew up. I learned everything I learned. All the blessings, all the graces, all the mercies came from here. I remember in, in the earlier days, our Father and the Lord had decentralized the, the church. And we had uh, one of our, our, our pastors, our leaders, always on the evangelistic forefront. And then he says, every Saturday, everybody must gather. Gather here by, it could be 2 p.m. or 3 p.m. or whatever. He made it exciting. And then we'll gather. And I was very young at the time. And I'll gather. And then we had a leader. They said, okay, uh, brother so-and-so, brother so-and-so, you two young ones, join this brother. And uh, I don't want to mention names, but that, that, that we'll, we'll join them. And I still remember one early Saturday morning. We went out to the field and we're just with him. I was by his left, my brother was by his right, and we got into the field and he took up the megaphone. He began to preach. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son of whosoever. And if you're there, whosoever you may be, whatsoever you may have done, wheresoever you may have gone, and we were so loving it, and then suddenly some responded and then and then not not too long somebody came up his balcony and he was he was ranting and raving he was mad and he said get out of this place leave this place immediately and that minister did not break a sweat i'm telling you the example was worth a thousand sermons he stood his ground and he stretched out his hand all day long to again same people and it was he began to beckon and plead and and tears began to come down his i was looking at our leader i said wow i said he really does care he's really concerned he's he really loves the lost this isn't some show this isn't the pastor compelling him to do things this is this is christ again Weeping over Jerusalem, I would have gathered you, but ye would not. And as the man was, and the man took a flower pot. No kidding. He took a flower pot and he hurled it in our direction. And while we were ducking, the leader, he stood there. He stood there. Let's take our young ones. Let's get them engaged. Let's show them what it means to stand for God. That yes, there may be opposition. But Christ, our mighty captain, leads against the foe. Onward into battle. See his banners go. That God is able to give victory. Catch them young. Keep them strong. Engage them long. Daniel was engaged by Babylon for many years. Engage them. Engage them. Keep engaging them. As they get out of, uh, out of, out of high school, engage them. In college, engage them. As they become young professionals, like our wonderful young professionals that we have, engage them because they, are, they, they have talent, they have graces, and by observing you, they can become all that God wants us to become. That's the example of Nebuchadnezzar. What about lessons from branches of the military? You know something? Here in these United States, they start recruiting people for the military from from uh, middle school. They'll say, they'll call it, um, there's, uh, I, 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 the name is uh, skipping my memory now, but they have these cadets. They recruit them from very early. They don't wait till they're adults. And then there's one of our brothers who works uh, in a military station and they have a strategic department 
responsible for recruiting young people. What pitch can we give them? How can we make the military exciting, the few, the proud, the marine? And then when you see that, and then they show them jet, jet fighter planes, let's make the church. The church is exciting. Paul says it was in the church. I saw visions of God. And Jacob said, while I was sleeping, the angels of God were ascending and descending. The church is exciting. The church is not boring. The church is the theater of God's best operation. Let's make that exciting. Number three, the lessons we learn from guerrilla warfare. Have you seen some African nations? Have you seen some children carrying guns, AK-47s? We, we, we don't endorse that. But it's, it's kind of interesting, right? That they give AK-47s to kids, little kids. And when we have a kid that wants to do something interesting, no, 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 you're not ready. We're not ready for that. So in the world, they are ready for AK-47. But in the church, they're not yet ready for the minutest of things. We got to change that. We got to change that. We got to harness everyone from their youth. To their hoary hairs for the glory of God. There's so many things as time will fill us. So number two, audacious mandate. The audacious mandate. When these men gathered, God didn't say, throw a pity party. Lament how the world has gone ahead of the church. Look at where we are. No, no, no. But the church of Jesus constant will remain. The Holy Ghost said, thank God for the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost is still saying, through our Father in the Lord, to the regions beyond, I must go. I must go. Till the word of the Lord. Till it's proclaimed. Till it is preached. Exalting the king and extending the kingdom. That's what the Holy Ghost said. An audacious man. You mean in a post-COVID world, yes. You mean in a post-modern world, yes. The needs have not changed. Men continue to dwell in darkness. So the gospel must be preached. As they ministered to the Lord and they fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Saul and Barnabas. Separate me Saul and Barnabas for the work whereunto I have called them. So here then it is. Young men before God receiving a revelation. Not a new revelation. You know, there's so many young ministers across the land. They're preaching something new. Something different. They say, an angel came to me. I would say, sir, uh, an angel came to you, but the Holy Ghost said to us in the word of God, go to the regions beyond. The Holy Ghost is still saying the same thing. Go. Go, go, go. In Asia, go. Australia, go. In Africa, go. In America, go. Keep going. Keep going to the ends of the, the earth. is not flat. Just keep going. Keep going. And you will find souls to minister unto. The mission of reaching the lost, the model of realizing our goal, the majesty that re-energizes our soul. There isn't time to go through everything now. But you know, one of our, one of our, in one of our churches, one of our pastors was saying that he got a, a, a Navy man stationed in Okinawa who visited the church, uh, Okinawa, Japan. And when the young, when the Navy officer came, he said, uh, sir, uh, pastor, I'd I like to see you, sir. And pastor said, sure, sure, come on up. All right, and they, and they sat down somewhere and he said, what's the mission of this church? What's the vision of this church? And uh, <laughs> the pastor said, uh, the, the mission is to preach. <laughs> the mission is to go, to reach Christ. Um, but this military man, they had been taught in the military, mission, vision, values. You line them up and then you look at them Day in, day out, and you pursue them with might and main. You pursue them with passion and fervor. And the, the Navy man was saying, but Pastor, that's not enough. Where, where is it written down? Show me your vision. Show me your mission. And Jesus Christ was very clear to us 
what our, what his mission was and what our mission should be in Luke chapter 4 from verse 18 to verse 19. Luke chapter 4 from verse 18 to verse 19. And the Bible tells us in Luke 4, 18 to Jesus was clear what he came to do, what he was supposed to do, how long he was going to do it, what tools he needed. He said, and the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He had sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Very clear, crystal clear. I'm asking you, is your mission crystal clear? Is it Jesus and business? Is it Jesus and something else? Because the reality is unless we give all that we are and all that we have to this mandate, we may fall short. By the grace of God, we will not fall short in Jesus' name. Clear mandate. Luke 9.56, for the Son of Man is not come to destroy, but to save. Luke 19 verse 10, the Son of Man is come to seek and to save the lost. Audacious mandate, a clear mandate, and we must make it clear to our young ones. What shall he profit a man if he gains the whole world? Then he loses his soul. What can a man give in exchange for his soul? So these men were very clear in our mission. And we should make the mission clear to our young ones. I just want to just spend a few minutes and talk about, maybe a, not maybe a few minutes, maybe a minute, minute or so. On, on, uh, the, I came across a term called the coca colonization of the earth. Coca colonization. That is, you are familiar with Coca-Cola. And you're familiar with colonization. It's not a word that we like very much, but it's, it's in our history. It's there. We recognize it. Now you combine those two terms. Have a Coke and a smile. You remember that? And then colonization. And I said, it's called Coca colonization. And do you know and our Father in the Lord has, has told us before. But do you know that there, there, there are think tanks that are saying, okay, okay, hang on, hang on a second, everyone. How can we get this product, not just in these United States, not just during the war, the Second World War, how can we get it to Asia, Antarctica, get it to Africa, get it to Europe, even get it to the moon? How can we get this product anywhere and everywhere? This is what God wants for the gospel. Christ, before Coca-Cola came along, Christ had already said, go into all the world and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things. Listen to this. coca colonization, alternatively, Coca, coca colonization refers to the globalization of American culture, also referred to as Americanization, pushed through popular American products such as soft drink brand Coca Cola. It is a premature that is something that goes before the name of the multinational soft drink maker and colonization. It was a deliberate plan. And here, the Holy Ghost hatched a master plan. You know, Satan was ruling in Ephesus. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. The Holy Ghost said, I'm coming, wait for me. I'm preparing some men here, some young adults. They're here. I'm cooking them in this global workers conference. By the time I send them, and the Holy Ghost hatched the plan. He said, separate me. Let's start with Barnabas and Saul. Listen, many times we're trying to do grandiose things. Start small. 
Call your young adults. They could be 15. Pair them. You two, you two, you two, you two, you two, you two. Get an older adult. Somebody who is more experienced in the field. And say, you become their mentor. You their mentor. You their mentor. You their mentor. You their mentor. You. And not, not mentoring without purpose. Mentoring either in prayer. Mentoring, let's go together and preach. Mentoring, here is how the word of God is shared. Deliberate mentoring. And this is how the church in Antioch went forth into the world. As we're teaching our mentors, number one, teach them to communicate and not to castigate. Communicate the gospel. Don't castigate. If we're going to impact this culture, somebody said, if you, if you cut off somebody's nose and you give him a rose to smell, he, he can't smell it. And so if you make the gospel unpalatable, either by your actions or by your mannerisms or by things like that, then that's very difficult. So we make the gospel palatable. Communicate. Don't castigate. Number two, communicate. Don't separate. Contextualize. Don't proselytize. We're not supposed to foist ourselves and our culture on people. Rather, we are to preach Christ lovingly, carefully. 2 Timothy chapter 3 from verse 10. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we're reading uh, from verse 10. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we're reading for Paul the Apostle was telling Timothy to look at his life. For thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which come unto me in Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all I will live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. Our time is uh, far spent. Let's go to the third point very quickly. The anointed missionaries. The anointed missionaries. So now they've been called. Now they've, they've ministered to the Lord. Now they've waited on him. Now their mandate is clear. Now we're trained them, taught them, disciple them, love them. Now the Holy Ghost sends them forth. He will send us. Come on, say, he will send me. He will send you because you're important to him. Our young adults are important to him. Our children are important. Our youth are important. Those in the colleges, those in the campuses, those everywhere, they're important to the Lord. In Acts chapter 13, Acts 13, now they have gone forth to their mission. Verse 4. So being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, they departed unto Seleucia. And from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God. They preached the word of God. They preached the word of God in the synagogues. And then the Bible tells us that they met a man who tried to oppose them. They preached the timeless message. But these men were trained and they were militant. Let's teach them how to respond to opposition. Let's teach them that in the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Then Saul, verse 9, who is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O foot of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, will thou not cease to pervert the right way to the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately, somebody shout immediately. Immediately the church is triumphant. Immediately we reach our goal. Immediately we get all the obstacles out of the way. Immediately, immediately from this conference, we go forth in strength, in power, in might, with purpose. Immediately, it's going to happen today. Rise on your feet as we talk to God in prayer. Our God is a mighty God. The church is a militant church. 
church and the church of Jesus will stand the test of time. All other things will crumble. But the church will stand. The Bible will stand like a rock undaunted mid the raging storms of time. Its pages burn with the truth eternal. And they glow with the light sublime. The Bible. It stands. Though the hills will crumble, I will, I will plant my feet on the firm foundation for the Bible will stand. The anointing of God is coming on your life. It's already on you. It's already on you. It's already in your life. And we're trusting God that in every aspect of the church, anointed children, anointed young adults, anointed youth, as we go forth with the message, my brother, assemble them. Dear, dear pastor, assemble them. Don't give up on them. Don't look down on them. Don't think little of them. The Lord will walk through them. And the Lord worked with them. And the Lord worked in them. Teach them the basics of the gospel. Salvation, teach them. Sanctification, teach them. That the power of God comes upon the saved, sanctified vessel. Let them believe. Make church exciting. Make God. God is an exciting God. The angels are excited. Why don't you get excited? Get the young ones excited for God. To serve the Lord with all their heart, with all their might, with all their spirit, with all their being. It can be done. The gospelization of the world. If Coca-Cola can do it, my brother, we can do it. If Coca-Cola can do it, my sister, we can do it. To the regions beyond. To far and wide. Every corner, every nook and cranny. Rise up. Rise up. Rise up. The entire church. And let's take the world for Christ. Faithful is he who has called us. Who also will do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father, we bless your name. We thank you for the opportunity, the Lord, that we've had to examine the gospel and to see that, Lord, greater is he that is with us than he that can ever be against us. Thank you for the church, triumphant, victorious. Lord, we pray every branch of the church, our fathers, our young ones, our children, our women, our men, Holy Spirit divine, will be used by God, raised up a mighty army for your glory in Jesus' name. So call us together, Lord, and send us forth. Call us together, build us up. Call us together, train us up. Unite us, O God, Father. And like a mighty army, O Heavenly Father, we'll go forth and reach the lost. And your name be glorified. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.